I wonder if anyone has ever counted the numbers of the people in our bastion, in that magic square just in front of Hagia Sophia, swarmed by people at all times. I mean, people of all sorts. Messengers, slaves carrying news from one place to another, beggars, officers, artists, petitioners hoping to be accepted by someone in the palace, nuns handing them out to good Christians to collect donations to repair the roof of their convent, damaged in the last spring's storm. Let me think, I think the last Sunday was the 27th year of the damage made by that naughty storm, which obviously has a bad habit of damaging the same roof again and again and again. Knowing that the icon of the Virgin Mary, which is said to have been brought all the way from Jerusalem by Theodosius' sister Pulcaria, will be walked along the Mesa Street, as they always do whenever there's an earthquake somewhere in the country, and aspiring to watch this spectacle from the beginning, the children of Samathia who flock there, the so-called inventors who believe that they had invented something new and hope to earn money or be rewarded over it. Frightening faced ecclesiastics, traveling from one city to another, preaching and saying that those recent earthquakes are the resultant of the wrath of the God, as you, the sinful Christians, are still tempted by the chariot races in the Hippodrome and those theater shows where immoral women expose their half-naked bodies. Stray dogs chasing each other. And of course, the sound of bells calling people to prayer. A one-legged Ostrogoth veteran apparently cast aside after having been used enough in the shitty wars of the sovereigns, hold the entrance to Hagia Sophia on Sundays and hold out his hand to good Christians, may God save them, to ask money. I wouldn't be surprised if he had been giving orders with great confidence to his subordinates in wars until a year ago. An officer working in the palace walks towards somewhere with fast steps, wearing a mysterious expression on his face as if he is doing a secretive job. Every now and then, litters with silver-plated doors, carried by eight or ten slaves, pass by. Their window parts are adorned with curtains of red silk cloth so that you can better understand how rich and important they are. There are noble women in them. From time to time to see where they are, they open the curtain of the window with their elegant clothed hands and give a disdainful glance to the lower class people outside. I met eye to eye with one of these women recently. Ah, how beautiful she was. I wouldn't mind to bet her, frankly speaking. Actually, I think she liked me too. It was as if I saw a vague smile on her face as she looked at me. But probably because she thought that I was not noble enough as I was wandering around on food, she quickly closed the curtain. Bloody bitch. Bare-shouldered waitresses serving customers in taverns and inns respond with real spit to the fake spit of an old man passing by and calling them immorals. Ah! I almost forgot, our well-known drunken sailors, who, even if they are Christians of the deep, are still careful not to do anything to anger Poseidon, their old pagan god, just in case they might get caught by a formidable storm in the middle of a gigantic sea. Lovers who meet in a secluded spot near the city walls under an arch with a relief, which everyone has forgotten which goddess it belongs to. Uh, pretend to be the family members visiting their relatives in the army in order not to attract the attention of prudish meddlers. And in theatres, plays written by either Euripides or Sophocles are interspersed with sex, desire, lust and jokes. Sex and laughter. <laughs> Who could ask for more than that? <laughs>